is something that we normally don't do on Sunday mornings, but of course from last week we uh, felt that it was very necessary, um, especially since we have been seeing what we've been seeing all over the world. Um, we went through really Ezekiel 38 last week, and uh, it was a little uh, taxing going through and finding out the names of all of these players this being the invasion, or what some call the War of Gog and Magog. And we explained it, uh, really the players that we're looking at, the countries that we're looking at, as we went through and see um, exactly what God's Word was showing us. And we saw that Gog being a demonic spirit, a demonic prince, a principality that was, of course, in charge of that area to the north um, of Israel, stretching throughout Russia. And we saw that this is a time in which something happens, and we're going to see what that something is today, that what we believe is going to cause such an invasion. But we saw that there are many countries as they are involved, as they march toward Israel, for one common purpose, and that, of course, is to take that which is not theirs. To take a resource, to, to, to spoil the land, and to loot this area. But we also saw how God was in control, in full control, of what was taking place. And how He will be magnified, and He will be glorified, and He will be shown as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. 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 I want you to look here today in Ezekiel 39, and we'll be reading here in just a moment. But I want to go back here and look, and I want you to show me that first slide up there, if you will, Hasten. Um, of course, go to the next one. I want us to see here that if you remember that these are players going all the way back to the sons of Noah, specifically the sons of Japheth. And that this is not just something that, uh, of course, has taken place recently, even though we are seeing the fruits of what has happened historically to Israel down through the years. But as we begin to read these names, we'll go ahead and slide to the next one, we saw that Magog, Meshach, Tabal, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish. We saw that these names specifically translated to the countries that we're looking at today, and we're going to see this even more today, but go ahead and slide to the next one. We saw that that involves Russia, it involves Ukraine, it involves Turkey, it involves Iran and Syria, Ethiopia and Sudan, Libya, and many of the ex-Soviet states that often end and stand. And they're all coming together. Now, what, what's surprising is that many years ago, the, this confederation of nations did not make sense. It did not make sense. It did not make sense to Ezekiel whenever he was writing this. But as we get closer to the prophetic events, as they take place, prophecy comes alive. Prophecy becomes more specific than it was when Ezekiel first saw it. And we see that, that for this confederation of nations to come together, it now makes perfect sense. And after today, it's going to make even more perfect sense. Because we are seeing something happen here in our world, and we are at the threshold. And I explained to you last week that I believe with all of my heart that, and I showed you specific places in Ezekiel 38, why I believe the church is already gone when this happens. Now this is my question to you. If we believe that the church is already gone whenever this battle takes place, and we believe that it is this battle that will directly usher in the seven year tribulation, I'm going to show you that today too, if we believe that all of this takes place and then we see that all of this is coming together like a perfect package right now, my question to you is how close does the rapture have to be? 
How close does His coming really have to be? If we are, and I've said it many times and I'll continue to say it, you always know that it's Thanksgiving because the Christmas lights come out. Right? You always know that the rapture is near because we see all of these things lining up perfectly close. There is no specific sign of the rapture. The rapture is a sign. Nothing has to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. Understand that the rapture itself is a sign. So if all of these prophecies are written pointing us to the seven year tribulation, pointing us to the return of Jesus at the end of the tribulation, how close does the rapture have to be? you got to get this. So this, this, is, this is so important as we go into this. But understand who we are dealing with here whenever we're looking at these countries right here. Ezekiel 39, do you have it? Say amen. amen. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tabal. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Notice what it says, the sixth parts. That means that literally we are dividing the army into six pieces. Now that don't mean much to you and I, but it's actually an old Hebrew idiom. That it actually, it, it talks about cutting the army in six pieces. We have a terminology in our English language that, that, that is similar to this. How many ever heard of the word decimate? Decimate, literally deci, means to cut into ten parts. It means to destroy into ten parts. This is the Hebrew idiom where it talks about cutting into six parts. Why is six important? Six is the number of men. This is cutting in six parts and he says that he is going to bring them upon the mountain and he will but cause a sixth part of thee. That means that whenever all of this is said and done, there ain't going to be but a sixth left of what's happening here. A sixth left of this great and mighty army that's marching toward Israel. Verse number three, And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Meaning I am going to take all of your weapons, all of your missiles, all of your arrows that you think that you're going to be throwing them at my people and I am going to strip them from your hand before you have the right and you have the opportunity to fire them at my people. Okay? Verse number four. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous, notice this, mark this right here, I'm going to come back to it in just a moment, unto uh, the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beast of the fields to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Yeah. Carelessly. That word right there, carelessly. Do you know what that means? That means that they are without concern. They are without fear. They feel secure. They're unexpected. They have no worry. These are people that are looking at what's going on and this is what they're saying. They're saying, I see God's hand at work and I don't even think twice about it. I'm not afraid of it. We, we, we talked about the importance of fearing the Lord last week. And understand that these are people that look at what's going on and they're standing back and they're saying, we're okay, we're fine, it, it, it doesn't involve us. And God said, I'm going to strike such an abundance of wrath upon this area that even the ones that feel that they're okay and they're secure and they won't be affected, even those will be affected. Even they will be judged. Even they will feel the wrath of what I am doing here. Verse number 7. Watch, I'm going somewhere, so follow me closely. So will I make my holy name known 
in the midst of my people Israel and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. God, understand this. I've said it one time before. I'll say it again. God will get full credit from this. This is not something... This is not something that you can blame on a country or point your fingers here or there. God Himself will get credit for what's happening. They will look at this in such a way and they will say there's no way that this was done by a leader. There's no way that this was done by a country. There's no way that this was just some happenstance. This was not a coincidence. But God Himself will get such credit from this that even the ones that claim they don't even believe in God will have to look and acknowledge that there was a higher power that was at work. That there is something that's going on here. And I can't explain it. You can't explain it. But honey, we know that God is working. Amen? Now watch verse number 8. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons. Both the shields, notice this, they will burn the weapons. Both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire. How many years? Somebody tell me. Seven years. Now what does that right there mean? Whatever these weapons that they tried to fire at Israel, or that they were thinking they were going to fire at Israel, they have been destroyed in such a way, and there's something specific about these weapons, Mike, that they must be burned. They can't be collected, but they must be burned. And notice that as, as they burn, now watch, as they burn in the open fields, as they burn on the mountainsides, as they burn in these desolate areas of, uh, of Israel, these desert areas of Israel, as they burn, whenever you burn something, what, 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 what comes up? They will be burning for seven years. This is a sign of remembrance that every time I look over on the mountain, Every time I look out in the open field and I see the smoke, watch, I'm gonna, and I see the smoke of God's fury and wrath rising up, that it will be as a reminder that I didn't do that, man didn't do that, God did that. It will act as a reminder. Now, why, why is this important? Because it says that they will burn for how many years? Seven years. Years. Now, where, what, what event could we possibly be waiting on that would be a time of not, not approximately? The Bible gives it to us in weeks. The Bible gives it to us in months. The Bible even gives it to us in days. Exactly seven years. The seven year tribulation. Could it be that God's Fury is on showcase in such a way that, it, that, that the countries that have marched against Israel are flattened in such a way that there's a man in the shadows that stepped forth and he creates what Daniel 9.27 talks about, the, the, the uh, 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 contract with many, meaning Israel and many countries, for seven years, or what he calls one week. Could it be that God's uh, 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 power has caused such a shaking that these countries would have to come to Israel and agree that they ain't going to attack Israel anymore and there would be a treaty, a contract signed between Israel and these countries for seven years after this war has taken place? I call it a war. It ain't much of a war. It's just God putting them out. You hear what I'm saying? So understand, could it, could it be? Could it be that all of this has taken place and showing us how that God is wrapping things up in a nice little package, pulling all of these prophecies from Ezekiel, all of these prophecies from Zechariah, all of these prophecies from Daniel, and He's putting them all together, and we have to be aware to be able 
to see them and to recognize them. Understand this. Now clean up. This is the only battle I was telling Coda last week. This is the only battle, the only pro prophetic battle that you'll find in your Bible where God gives them specific instructions on how to clean what's happened. They weren't involved in the battle. The biggest thing they have to do is clean up after God has took out the trash. They have to clean up. So He gives them specific instructions on what to do. Now what, what are these instructions? Watch this right here. Uh, look in verse number 10. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. Notice He's given very specific instructions here. Something has happened here, watch. Something has happened to where the lumber in the fields, the lumber in, in, in the areas is unusable. Something is wrong to where they are not able to burn this lumber. Is it, so, is it radioactive? Is it something that's, that's, that, that, that's biological? What is happening with the lumber that, that, that they are not able to take the lumber from the fields? Watch verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place thereof graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers, on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog in all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamongog. Now watch. It's on the east side of the Jordan. I want you to flip that slide up there. Uh, Notice this. You see where, where it says the Dead Sea. This is on the east side, the Jordan side of the Dead Sea. Now if you go right up above where it's marked Dead Sea, you'll see that that is the Valley of Jordan. This area here, and, and, and there was a very common trade route through there that was known as the Valley of the Passengers. There's a lot of, lot of debate on exactly which which line, which lane, if you want to say, which lane is considered the valley of the passengers. But as people would come down out of Syria, and as they were marching toward Egypt, they would have to go by this area, and therefore it got its nickname, the valley of the passengers. But as they were coming through there, watch very closely. As they're, as they're coming through there, it says that their noses are stopped. There is such a stench of, uh, of death and decay in this area as they see these armies have been obliterated that even the ones that would normally just pass by are unable to pass by because of such a magnitude of death that is in this area as the wrath is. Now hold on. That's not the only place that we're going to see. But this right here, there's, cause there's, there's two invasions. There's two invasions that take place. One is right at this valley of, of the passengers on the Jordan side. But then the Bible also talks in 39.18 that, that, that it also says that it will be in the area of Bashan. What is Bashan? Flip, flip the slide here. This is just a, a better map. Go ahead and flip it again. Bashan is the area up at the northern part of Israel of what we know is a hotbed for all types of war, the Golan Heights. This has been a hotbed ever since that, that they were fighting over it in 1967, fighting over it again in 1973 with the Yom Kippur uh, War. This has been a hotbed of conflict for the last 50 plus years. This still remains an area where people are looking at, and Israel, of course, Israel knows it's their land. But the rest of the international uh, community wants to point their fingers at Israel and say, nope, that's not your land. Understand that Israel is a, a, a country about the size of the state of New Jersey. And they're wanting to take a state about the size of New Jersey and cut it and cut it and cut it and keep trimming and keep trimming here. I mean, we have the Golan Heights that's cut out here. You see that next green block? Flip to, to, to the uh, next slide. Right there at the West Bank, that whole area that encompasses Jerusalem, they want to say that doesn't belong to Israel either. And then if that's not good enough, 
You, we have on the shoreline, the western shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea, we have the Gaza Strip that they still don't want to acknowledge belongs to Israel. And understand who they're giving it to. They're giving it to terrorist organizations. Not rightful countries. Not real. We have Hezbollah up here to the north, up here in Lebanon and Syria. We have Hamas over at the Gaza Strip trying to claim that. And they're not even rightful people. They're not even, they're, they're, they're not even recognized people. This right here is just the type of conflict and mess that's being stirred up as people want to look and say, well, hold on, that's not Israel's land. You can't claim that. That's, that's Palestine. Some, some made up phony name that they want to give these people just to keep from calling them God's people, the Israelites. Understand what's happening here. So this, this, this hotbed, this hotbed that's happened, up, here we go, understand that as the valley, here, this is a close-up, see right here at Jericho? Do you realize that right across from Jericho, people had looked at this for years and saying, how in the world, this don't even make sense. This doesn't make sense at how or why anybody would ever invade in this area. Guess what they've done to Jericho? They've built it up in such a, in such a way. They've got casinos that's in Jericho. I mean, the, the Jordanians have come in and under their custodianship, they have made this a bustling place. But as they come in and as they march through this area, God strikes them down there and there's another strike up in the Golan Heights. And God says they're going to be scattered upon the hillsides, upon the mountainsides. Now, He tells them that the weapons are going to be burning for seven years. Now, but then this, 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 this gets me thinking about something else. Look in verse 12. Verse 12 right here. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, and they shall may or that that they may cleanse the land seven months. Watch, they have to wait seven months. Then it takes them seven months to be able to bury all the people. Now, that's a lot. But hold on, why is it seven months? Because most people will tell you that radioactive material is extremely high. This is just a theory. This is just a possibility. Radioactive material is extremely high for six months. On the seventh month, it is able to be withstood with certain proper uh, uh, equipment and suits as you would go in and dispose of whatever it is that's radioactive. Could this be telling us of what's happening? Could this give us clues as to what's happening? Now watch verse 13. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. And it shall be to them a uh, shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. He keeps saying this. I mean, this is this is the most important part. If you've not recognized the theme of thirty eight and thirty nine, this is the most important part that God will get the glory. Verse fourteen, and they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it after the end of seven months they shall search. So they'll have to wait seven months. But notice what happens. They bring in private contractors. Continual employment. They bring in private contractors to bury the dead. They bring in people. Now verse 15 gives us, I mean, folks, you can't make this up. I mean, this is perfect in the Bible. Watch what verse 15 is right here. Look in verse 15. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any see a man's what? Bone, then shall they do what? Set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. Where have we seen that happen before? Whenever people are exposed to certain amounts of radiation, ra radioactive material, they have to put one of those nice little fancy biohazard signs up by whatever it is until telling everybody, don't go near that. And notice, it's, it's their bones. Radiation is absorbed in the bones. Understand this. So they go through and they look at this and they say, can't touch that. Just set up a sign by it until the private contractors, 
the professionals that have been hired to come in here. I mean, you can't, you can't make this up. This is perfect. And it's lining up with what I and like I said, we don't know. But whatever it is that God has that has brought fire, that has brought floods, that has brought the shaking of the earth, whatever has happened here has completely obliterated these armies. Now, <laughs> I wish y'all knew what I was going to say. Y'all just get happy about this, but just, 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 just follow me on this, okay? Verse 16, I love it. I love it. Verse 16, watch this. And also the name of the city shall be Hamana, thus shall they cleanse the land. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Notice, this is the second time they've said this, okay? The second time he's wrote this about the feathered fowls and the beast of the field. Watch. Assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice unto the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. And ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of princes of earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, and of, the, and of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. Now let's stop here for one second. He says that whatever's happened, notice all animal life gone. The beast, the rams, the bullocks, and then he says the princes, the mighty men, Gone. Now you say, Ryan, that sounds an awful lot like a nuclear bomb. This is the problem I have with that. If a nuclear bomb is dropped, who gets the glory? Okay? Let's help out one more time. Israel, I said, is about the size of New Jersey. If you dropped a nuclear bomb on New Jersey, what would happen to New Jersey? Gone. And not just New Jersey, but New York, Pennsylvania. I mean, we're even feeling it down here. Okay? So this is something that is specific to where it gets the ones that are on. In fact, that's going to be the miracle. How, watch, how did God take out the ones on the mountainside and not affect the people in the cities. Y'all didn't get to. If they'd have got that, they'd have ran. You know that? They would have. Now hold on just a minute. But then it says two times. It says we're calling all the feathered fowl. We're calling all the beast to feast. He said, I am making a sacrifice myself to them. Now it's interesting. 1967, during the Six Day War, in the area of Bashan, or the Golan Heights, there was approximately about 15 nests of endangered vultures. Okay? Griffin vultures. These griffin vultures have approximately a 9-foot wingspan. They can travel up to 300 miles in just a couple hours. And they can pick a carcass clean literally clean within about four hours. Now watch this. As they're coming through here, 15 nests, 1967. That right there is approximately about 50 of, of these vultures. 50 vultures don't mean anything. Fast forward now over the past 20 years, and these vultures, have, even though still endangered, these vultures have now grown to approximately about 400 of these vultures that are in this area. 400 vultures. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. That, 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 that's good for a Sunday lunch, but not a big deal. Okay? But then, it's very odd that these griffin vultures, they got to have some kinfolk around somewhere. Okay? So, 
there's another endangered vulture that's even bigger than the griffin vulture. And it is the Cenarius vulture. Now, these, very endangered, but hardly ever, ever, ever in the Middle East. Usually they'll hang up in the mountaintops of Europe, or they'll hang out over toward India, but hardly ever in the area of the Middle East. Flip that slide right there. Just December, watch, December the 8th, 2021, they document the rare vulture in Israel. So now, hold on, but, 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 but what did it say? It said the ravenous birds of every kind. So not just, hold on, not just the griffin, not just the scenarios, but let's bring all of them. Now, 1973 is called the Yom Kippur War because Israel was attacked during the time, the feast falls, or the, 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 the fall feast of Yom Kippur. Most of the times, even historically, you go back to the Bible days, if Israel is going to be attacked, they're going to be attacked during the feast. When are the feast? The feast are usually our time of, of uh, uh, Easter during the spring feast or about September, October during the fall feast. Guess what? Mating season and migrating season for these birds and everyone like it is during guess which months? Spring and fall as they are literally hundreds of thousands of these birds, and guess which pathway they take? Right down from the Mediterranean Sea, all the way down through the Valley of Jordan, as they go in toward Egypt. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. If y'all heard what I said, y'all ought to run right now. Do you see how this is all coming together? You say, Ryan, why is it? Here we are, a bird ain't never spotted there, and there it is, and guess what God's Word just said? All right, all right. These and all of their cousins are coming to feast Amen. on the bones of these mighty men. Amen? Amen. Amen. Cleaning them. I, absolutely, the cleanup is there. But Now hold on, that's just a little bit. We're, 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 we're getting into this. Now watch, watch verse 21. Verse 21. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them, so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day, and what? For <laughs> Understand that once again, these two groups will be addressed who witness the power of the Lord. There will be two groups that will witness this. You want to see the two groups? It will be the group of Israel, and it will be the group of what the Bible calls the heathen. I don't read not a word in there that says anything about the church. Amen. Could it be because the church ain't here? Amen? We are out. We're gone. We've left. Checkout time. It's gone. It's all. So could it be that it's all over with at this time? Here we are. But he says from this day forward, that means all the way through the seven year tribulation, as they look over on the mountainside and see those weapons burning, as they have seen it, all they can say is, I don't know what happened, but God did it. Yeah. Amen? But now hold on just a minute. 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 I want you to remember something. I want you to remember something. 38, Ezekiel 38 and verse 4, the Lord says that he tells us, tells us right there, that he's in full control. How did he tell us that he was in full control? Remember, this is a demonic prince, a demonic principality, Gog. What did he say? He says that he will take Gog and he will put hooks in the jaw of Gog, Meshach and Tabal, and watch, he will drag them back down. He says, first, I'm going to send you back up north, and then... He says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaw and I'm going to drag you down. Now, we've tried, to, we, we've, we've tried to say that hooks in the jaw was all kinds of things. 
We've said the hooks in the jaw since you eat with your jaw that it's got to be food. We've said all kinds of things. I think we've missed the point. When you had a wild animal, what you would do in order to gain control over that animal is you would put a bit in its mouth and you would put hooks through its jaw and you would literally take that animal and drag that animal. And I guarantee you, you put hooks in its jaw and it's going anywhere you want it to. Okay? What are you saying? I'm saying God is the one that's doing the dragging. He's the one that's got the devil on a leash. He, he is bringing them down here for a specific reason. He said, I'm going to bring you down to these mountains and I'm going to show everybody around here who's really in control. I'm going to show what's going to happen here. I'm going to, to, to exhibit my power on you and ain't nothing you can do about it. Why? Because I've got you in a chokehold. Now watch this. Now this is important because he says, I'm the one that's got you here. I'm the one that has you in full control. Verse number 10 of, of, of chapter 38. Watch, listen to it very closely again. That at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. What does that mean? This means that something changes suddenly in the mind of these people. Something changes, something catches their eye. Something changes in the mind and the intentions of Magog. What is interesting right now is that Israel and Russia are in a very unusual relationship. Why do I say that? I told you last week, I said just two weeks ago, that, that uh, 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 Naphtali Bennett, the Prime Minister of Israel, went up to Russia, spent about three hours with Putin, and he was the one that was mediating between Ukraine and Russia. Now, what's interesting about this is that he also turned around and talked to Russia and gave his, uh, 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 gave his recommendation to what Ukraine should do. So then flip this right here. He looks at Zelensky. He looks at Zelensky and says that he should take Putin's proposal. He should take Putin's proposal. He's proposing that if you meet, meet four criteria, that the invasion will stop, all of this will stop, and, and we'll go on about our business. So Bennett here is in an unusual relationship with both Russia and Ukraine. Now this is going to mean something here in just a minute, so pay attention very closely. As he is mediating this, he looks over it. Now, first of all, just let me say this. The government of Israel is not the usual government. Okay? You've got to get this. We had a prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, of Israel, that was wrongfully cast out of Israel. We've experienced a lot of that ourselves. Okay? And they have now set up a, a, a puppet... Okay? The powers that be have set up a puppet government in Israel. Okay? And they are being controlled to do these certain things. So Israel, this government, these governmental officials of Israel, both the president and also the prime minister, is not our usual folks that we're okay with. Alright? you got to get this. So that's why he's saying unusual things telling them, maybe you need to take him up on this offer, okay? Now watch this. So then as we go through and we look at this, this relationship, what also makes it unusual is what's on the other side of Russia's relationship. Because Russia, as they are trying to have this cordial relationship with Israel, they're also extremely buddy-buddy with Iran. Okay? In fact, they're Iran's number one sponsor. Okay? Anything that happens in Iran, you can better believe that Russia is right behind it. Okay? Anything that happens in Syria, you better believe that Russia is right behind it. So, this is the problem. Iran wants to destroy Israel. You've got Russia, who's trying to be cordial with Israel, but is extremely buddy-buddy with Iran. So if I'm Israel, I want to look at Russia and say, listen, I need to know whose side you really own. Because you're trying to be my friend, but yet you're supporting and the number one funder of Iran 
as they have been this week in Austria, uh, 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 Vienna, Austria, as they have been making their discussions on this insane nuclear deal with Iran. In fact, let me tell you how insane that it is. Now, first of all, we have the other Iran nuclear deal that was back in uh, uh, 2008, uh, was it 2015 that was negated by Trump in 2018. But understand that where we sent billions of dollars to Iran and say, please don't blow us up right now. I want to give you billions of dollars. You can go ahead and, and, and make your nuclear bomb. Let me give you your pacifier, but please don't blow us up right now. Okay? Now watch. So then, this, this week, literally this week, they're having talks in Vienna. As they're having these talks, the United States is not even at the table. Iran plainly said to the leaders of the world that we'll come and have these nuclear talks, but the United States is not allowed in the room. They are pushed out the door. Watch. They're pushed out the door, and they're sitting at the kitty table talking their business while Iran is inside with the adults talking their stuff. You say, Ryan, what does that mean? Guess who's negotiating on the United States' part? You're going to love this. Guess who is negotiating the number one negotiator for the United States? Russia. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay? Now, as we see all this happen, what does this mean? Because isn't it amazing at how we see these nations that are aligning, number one, Russia has told Ukraine that they are not to join NATO. Well, let's see who is a part of NATO. Flip this right here. Who is a part of NATO? You see all the blue? All the blue, that's a part of the North Atlantic. The NATO Council here. And notice this big blue nation down here toward the corner. Turkey. Turkey is a very unusual nation. Now you're going to get this. I've been telling folks forever. I said, you got to watch Turkey. Back when Turkey wasn't even thought of. I said, you got to watch Turkey because you cannot have Meshach and Tabal. You cannot have Tagarma without Turkey. Okay? Now Ukraine is in pink because Ukraine is in talks. But Russia has already said that they are not going to do this. Georgia is almost definite they're going to be uh, uh, put into NATO, I would say within the next year is what they're saying. Now this is important here. Because what do most of, of these NATO countries that will not speak out against Russia? We are here in the United States. We're casting our uh, 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 fight against them. We're telling them that they cannot invade Ukraine. They cannot do this. The United States is turning around and looking at all these other NATO countries... And they're saying, why don't you uh, sanction them like we've sanctioned them? And they're saying, we ain't getting involved. Now why is this? Flip this. Russia has the largest natural gas reserve in the world. Okay? 47,000 billion cubic meters. Russia, now watch this, you got, you got to go watch this. Russia supplies Europe, most of Europe, with 40% of their natural gas supply. Russia also supplies them with upwards of 30% of their oil supply. Okay? So as they're looking at this and they're going, we ain't touching this because Russia cuts us off of our natural gas, we're done. In fact, if Russia cuts them off of 40% of their export uh, or their import of natural gas, let me tell you how prices are going to go at that point in time. First of all, you won't be able to find the natural gas in Europe. And if you do find natural gas in Europe, it's going to be so astronomical, you won't be able to afford it. Russia, let's, let, me, let, me, let, let me give you some comparison. Russia only gives us less than 3% of our oil. That's why Joe Biden's a liar about the gas prices. Because less than 3% ain't, ain't going to amount uh, 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 to over a $2 price spike. Okay? Now watch this. So as they're saying we're not going to touch this, there's no way that we can survive 
If Russia cuts us off, then we don't know what to do. In fact, let me show you just how important this is. Flip this next one right here. They have taken these countries that are right beside of Russia, like Poland, Germany, Belarus, Finland, and Ukraine, and they have completely monopolized what they get. In fact, they supply these countries with over 75% of what they get. Do you see why they have Ukraine in a stranglehold right now? Okay? Now, I wanted to see who else is supplying with natural gas. So flip this next one. Watch this. Russia is the number one leader. Guess who's number two? Iran is number two. Okay? Guess who is number three? Qatar. Okay? Now watch this. United States is there, but right after the United States, watch this. We have Saudi Arabia. We have Turkmena. Stan, we have the United Arab Emirates, we have, then we get down to Venezuela, we have Nigeria, and guess who's last on the list? China. China. But watch this. As we have sanctioned Russia, we have driven Russia into the open arms of China. And we have also allowed them to strengthen their relations with Iran. Okay? Now, I was looking at this and I said, okay, Russia, Iran, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, who is that? Folks, can I say Magog? Can I say Persia? Can I say Sheba? Dedan? Tagarma? Do you see how this is coming here, okay? So what does this have to do with Israel? I'm glad you asked. Do you realize... That Israel has made a very prominent discovery about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, in fact it was last May I stood here and I told you a little bit about this, but I want you to see this. About 10 years ago they made a discovery of two massive gas fields off the coast of Israel there in the Mediterranean Sea. One is called the Leviathan gas field, the other one is called the, Tam, uh, the Tamar gas field. Now both of these gas fields together are more than adequate to supply Europe with their natural gas needs. Guess what they have been building during this whole time here? They're wanting to put, put their finishing touches on it. Flip this slide right here. There, there, there you can see, but watch. Voices from the Arab press. Israel's New secret weapon is what? Natural gas. They have been full steam ahead with this right here, flip it right here, of what's called the East Med Pipeline. And they, this right here will go, it will start off right off the coast of the Mediterranean Sea of, uh, of Israel, and it will go all the way up to, to uh, uh, Cyprus. And as it goes up through there, then it will head up into Greece and Italy and be able to supply these European countries with all of their natural gas needs. If they are supplied with all of their natural gas needs, guess who they don't need anymore? Guess who's going to get awful tore up about not being able to supply them with their natural gas? Okay, okay. Let's, 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 let's look at this here. So then, in fact, this is such a big deal. Look at the headline. Watch what it says. This right here was just, this was four days. Four days before Russia started their, their, their conflict with Ukraine. The Times of Israel. Pipeline politics. When Russia, Ukrainian, and, Isra and the Israeli lines intersect. Guess what it's all about? Natural gas. It's all coming here together. And this is such a big deal. that Look, flip this right here. The United States is now saying they were all for the East Med pipeline. Now the United States is saying, nope, we don't want to do this. Do you think Israel cares what the United States is saying right now about this East Med pipeline? They're going full steam ahead with this right here. And then I almost lost my mind. You ready for this? I almost lost it right here. I was looking at this and I said, how does this come together with some of the other prominent countries that we need? Don't you know that after a 14-year silence from one country, because of this pipeline, they have now full-fledged, I'm talking about coming to the negotiating table here, guess who has started their talks with Israel? Watch this. Flip it. 
Watch this. Keep it again. Flip it again. There just, what was that? March the 9th, 2022. We have the Israeli president meeting with the president of Turkey. After 14 years of not talking, Turkey wants the pipeline to go through Turkey so that they can benefit from this great natural gas supply. Now hold on. Israel currently gets their natural gas because they have not fully furnished this, this, this uh, uh, um, gas field yet. They get their natural gas from guess where? Northern Africa. Ethiopia. Egypt. Sudan. Libya. After they get this pipeline up and running and everything's going, Israel don't need their stuff anymore. Russia can't sell their stuff no more. Who's awful mad about this right now? If Turkey is left out of this negotiation, guess who's going to be awful mad about that? Who do we have? We have Magog. We have Tagarma. We have Meshach. We have Tabal. We have Tug uh, 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 Ethiopia. We have Libya. We have all. We have Persia. We have all of these countries coming together, just like on this map. Flip it right here all coming together because they are so upset with this natural gas field. Do you see how this thing, and this is why the Word of God says that they will come down and something will happen in their mind that will turn them against Israel and they will, they will think a thought that will be evil in that day and they will turn their uh, forces toward Israel to invade Israel and the Bible says to take a Spoil. What spoil could they possibly be taking? They don't care about their oil. They don't care about anything else. The one thing that has every one of these in a stranglehold is their natural gas supply that will be fully furnishing Europe. And at that time, Europe won't need Russia no more. Russia will be left out in the cold, driven into the arms of China. And folks, what do we have? Do you see how this is working together? Do you see how literally this could happen within months? If this could happen within months, how close, I ask you again, how close is the rapture of the church? Let me show you just how close. Ready for this? Just last week, just last week, guess what happened? Flip this slide. Just last week, Israel strikes Syria killing two of the Syrian Revolutionary Guards there. And guess what? Guess what Iran says? Iran says, we're going to do something back at you. Guess what happens? Flip it again. Here it is. Flip it again one more time. Guess what happens? Then, if you may remember, last Sunday as I was preaching the message here, that last Sunday, all of a sudden they had had attacks in Erbil, Iraq, near the U.S. consulate, as they were shooting down the 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 or, or, or uh, blowing up, trying to blow up the areas that was right near the Israeli stronghold there in Iraq. Do you see how this is? Iran has already said that they want to take out Israel, which is the little Satan, and they want to take out United States, which is the big Satan. They've already said it. And get this, the foreign minister, the French foreign minister had already said that Iran can have nuclear weapons within weeks, is what he said. The words come out of his mouth, weeks. What does that mean? You say, Ryan, we're all the way over here across the water. Folks, we live in 2022. With satellite technology, we have missiles that can easily go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. I don't know if you know that or not. And if there's a nuclear warhead that's attached to one of those missiles, bye. Bye. What am I saying? I'm saying that as I was studying this, there's something that should really shock and frighten most of us here. We've talked about Russia. We've talked about Turkey. We've talked about Israel. We've talked about Libya. We've talked about Iran. We've talked about Saudi Arabia. All the Middle East. If the United States is as prominent of a country as we are, 
Why are we not mentioned in prophecy? Why is the United States not... I mean, they, they've tried. Bible students have tried for years. I mean, they've, they've went chasing baby sheep and lions and everybody trying to make trying to make the United States something in the Bible. We've been here for 400 years. Do you know what I believe with all of my heart? I believe that we have served our purpose. You know what our purpose was? Our purpose was right here in the middle of the church age. As we end, as we come, as we draw near and to the close of the church age, our purpose during the dispensation of the church of Philadelphia, our purpose was to spread the gospel message around this world. And we've done it. And we've done it. We, we as the church of Jesus Christ, we have spread the gospel to every nook and cranny that you can possibly imagine in this world. We were a blessing to this world, to the church, to, to evangelize as much as possible. And in during this time, as everything is shifted back the focus to Israel, we don't have a place. Why do we not have a place? I believe we're gone. I believe that af after the rapture of the church, there is no United States of America. Not to say the United States is going to be raptured out. No, I, I, I pray that as many as raptured as possible. But I said it last week, I don't believe there's going to be enough to even matter. I don't believe there's going to be enough that's still left here that you'll ever miss them that they're gone. You might, if you know somebody personally, you might say, well, I wonder what happened to old Mike over there. I wonder where he went. But I'm trying to tell you right now, this place right here, it is changing. Everything is turned upside down. This right here, we were used for a specific purpose and the United States will not exist anymore. We will either be completely wiped out. You say, Ron, we're the greatest nation that's ever been put on this earth. You know why we're the greatest nation? We're the greatest nation because the Lord God Almighty blessed us to be the greatest nation. And I'm trying to tell you right now, we have forgot about him and since we have forgot about him there won't be no more honey we're gone Billy Graham made one of the most one of the most famous and one of the most true statements he ever made he said if America goes unjudged then God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and I believe that with everything that is within me we are here for a purpose. We were blessed for a purpose. We fulfilled that purpose. And it's during this time that we're just about to be out of here. I'm trying to tell you right now with all the stuff, do you realize out of 535 U.S. Congress people, I'm talking about Senate and Congress representatives both, do you realize I can count on one hand, one hand, the amount of, 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 of people that don't hate this country. I'm talking about people that was elected to go up to Washington, D.C. to serve the people of this country. I can count on one hand the amount of people that don't despise this country. And you don't think we're doomed? We got people that hate them out there, hate us from out there. They hate us from within. I'm trying to tell you that we have turned our back on God. We have turned our back on the one that blessed us. We got people that would rather fight about transgender and homosexuality and all the other... But We have a U.S. Uh, 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 army that don't give a rip about defending this place anymore. Do you know why? Because they've been brainwashed to worry about ridiculous politics instead of loving this country the way that they should love this country. We have been destroyed from the inside out and we have enemies at the gate. Yes. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Right. Folks, the innocent blood that's been shed in this country, if it goes unpunished, then God knows that He will be an unjust God. Right. Can I tell you something? Folks, the USA is not mentioned in the Bible. Right. Prophecy anywhere. Why? Because it's gone. Right. It's right. gone. It's gone. Now watch. I believe during this time, I believe with all of my heart during this time that God is severing a difference. Just like He did with the children of Israel. They were put up safely 
in the area of Goshen. And there they were as they were blessed, as they were protected, as they were fed, they were looked after. I believe that's what God's doing right here in this country right now with the church. But when the church ain't there no more, all bets are off. All bets are off. Do we understand how close this is? Do we truly understand what's happening right now in this country and in this world? Do we understand how vitally important it is that we spread our Gospel message? That we spread the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? That we witness every chance that we get? That we tell people, say, listen, you've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. You may not want to hear this. I didn't want to hear this. I know you don't want to hear this. But this is the truth. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Folks, I can't explain. I, 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 I can't stress any more than what the words have already been spoken here about how vitally important this time is. God is giving us an opportunity. He's giving us an hour. Prophecy as a warning showing us it's just about time. It's just about time. It's just about time. We have to get busy. And, I, and, and I'm looking around here and I wonder how many of us are sitting here today that's not ready. How many of us are sitting here right here today that if the Lord came back right now, you wouldn't go. You wouldn't go. You wouldn't go. If a nuclear warhead flew over our house right now and landed in your backyard, what would happen? This could be your last day here on this earth. This could be your last minute here on this earth. What would you do? What would you do? Because there's a real God. There's a real heaven. There's a real judgment. And we will give an account for ourselves. Not anybody else. Us. Giving an account for ourselves. The Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. Convicting you right now. Showing you right now of the condition that you're in. Can I tell you something? Without a church for a need of evangelism, America is of no good. And we have forgot about that. We have forgot about that. We have focused on everything else. We'd rather talk about which pronoun to use. Or, 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 or what to, 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 to say to not offend somebody. Folks, the hour is too late. The time is too near. This is too important. Let's stand to our feet. They're going to come to the instruments. Mm. Folks, the end is at the threshold. I beg you right now. I beg you right now. Take into account. Take into consideration. What condition is your soul in right now? What condition are you in right now? If He should come right now, what condition are you in right now? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask any of that today. If you're standing here today, you know whether you're lost or saved. You know where you stand with the Lord. They're going to begin to play. He's going to begin to sing. I want us to pray. I want us to gather around this altar. I want us to pray for this nation. I want us to pray for this church. I want us to pray for one another. And most of all, if you're here today and you're lost, I beg you, please, come to this altar.